This episode is brought to you by our partner, Ice Barrel. Cold therapy was an integral part of my training. When I was a gymnast, I would be in that cold tub after every training session for a number of years, and it's still something I take part of as part of my recovery, my mental health, as well as my performance in and out of the gym. Please check out their FAQ page for everything you need to know about ice barrel and cold therapy. If you've never tried cold exposure before, we cannot recommend ice barrel enough. They have events all over the U.S., and we also introduced conscious therapy as an added session at our Paramucky camp in 2022. It was a huge hit with our campers and coaches alike. We cannot wait to have them back again in 2023 for our 10-year anniversary. Please use Power Monkey. That's all caps, Power Monkey, no spaces, and save $75 off your ice barrel. Welcome to the Power Monkey Podcast, where we chat with the best in the world about what they do. I'm your host, Dave Durante, with my co-host, Mike Service, and on today's episode, we have a breakdown of the 2023 Noble CrossFit Games that just finished out in Madison, Wisconsin over the weekend. We got back home and wanted to discuss what we got a chance to see in person. Incredible performances, some new tests that we got to see these athletes go through, some things we liked, some other things that we did not like. We brought on Jason Lydon, one of our best friends within the space, owner of CrossFit Milford and Conquer Athlete, to discuss what it was like to be a coach out on the floor with his team, his master's athletes, some of the things that he saw from the coaching side of things, what we saw from a technical side with some of the new movements, as well as, as, well as some of our highlights from the weekend. We hope you guys can enjoy this one and maybe go back and watch the games again through a different lens. How you doing, How you man? Doing? Man, I'm fucking good. Dave. Good to I'm be tired. back. Yeah, it's so good. I How was did I not like... see you the whole weekend there? That Dude, it was, it was, hard. It it was text, I was texting you like every 15 minutes and like, <laughs> where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I mean, you're a busy guy when you're at the games, but I would have liked to, at least like to say hello. Just a hug or something. It, it was um, I know, dude. It was it it was like a no. It was like a very one gnarly time. week because the Masters went and I had with the Masters I had two people in the opposite division, so it was like one would go and then the other one would go like three hours later. So that was like all day for them. But in between them was a the team stuff, like briefings or like this and that. And then once they got ended over and it was a team stuff, I don't even know. Like, I look back on it. I'm like, yeah, I guess it wasn't, like, overly too much shit. But I felt like it was, like, a lot of, like, debriefing and, like, getting them ready for stuff in between workouts. And it was just – I didn't see anybody. Like, I saw Chris for, like, two seconds. And I bumped into him during the 5K run. I saw – I didn't see one person this year. It was, it was rough. I was exhausted. I was in San Diego for a week before for Camden for baseball. And then mm. – I went from San Diego right to I dropped I brought him home, jumped on a flight, went to Madison, and it was just like I was shot. I don't know how you guys travel so much. Well, we don't have three kids. <laughs> yeah, dude, dude, you have two. You have two little ones. <laughs> Make sure Sadie didn't hear that because she's like, "Yeah, I know you're never here. I know you're never here. I have two kids by myself." No, right, 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 right. Um, all right. What'd you think of the games overall Ooh. impression? Hold, hold on a second, Dave. Let's do like an official start. No, today. that was a great intro. Are you kidding me? We finally uh, had a good is, intro. That just went. Right now. No, this is phenomenal. That was totally Everybody's fine. I could have done the intro separately. Everybody's loving this. Let's continue. That right. was totally good. Right. I Everyone, email, email Jordan at PowerMonkeyFitness.com <laughs> if you love this <laughs> intro and any other suggestions <laughs> that you want to make for the podcast. Continue. <laughs> continue. <laughs> Jordan's so bad. Um, I can do the separate intro. No, just overall impressions before we get into nitty gritty. I enjoyed seeing Castro back in there. That definitely gave a different vibe. It almost in the background with the, where the athletes and the coaches were, it was almost like a sigh of relief that he was back. I'm gonna be honest. I thought why Fizet, why why do you say that? No one was no one liked the programming this year. People will do the say the politically correct thing, but a lot of people just weren't happy with the programming. Um, I think overall it was okay. I thought Boz did a, a amazing job last year. I thought this year was – I didn't think it was hard enough for the individuals. I thought it was too hard for the 60-plus. I thought there were too many bottlenecks around the intention of workouts. Um, you know, and I, that's just kind of like me nitpicking. And, like, I get it. Like, the games are the games, and it's the unknown and noble, and you're, you're at the mercy of whoever's doing the programming. But I thought for what 
it's kind of been about. I just thought there were too many things that just didn't flow well. You know, there's a lot of talks in the back about people hoping Dave takes it back over. And like, I thought Boz did an amazing job last year. I just feel like this year was like, I don't know, man. It just, it just felt different. It felt different back there. It did. And you, a lot you, of math. In, go ahead. Did you think that Castro had any input or you think it was just, it was too late when he came back on board? Cause we had Boz on the podcast last week and, you know, I think uh, Castro had a say in the secondary round of cuts that happened over the weekend. And there were some things that he put in that, you know, Boz didn't intend. But do you think that it was purely, you know, Boz putting the events together this year? Or do you think Castro had insight and input in it? I have no idea. I wish I could even answer that. But based yeah. off what you just said, it seems like Castro had some, yeah. some part of insight into it. I just felt like, I feel like there are too many spots where there's a bottleneck that took away from from the intention or something that could create more excitement. And I thought I thought the individual stuff was um it, you know, it's like you look at the individuals go and that's the best of the best. Those are the best people in the world. That's the one percenters. Like you want to see them do amazing things. You want to see them do things that I I want to see them do stuff that I can't do. You know, and I want to see them do these things where I'm like, wow, like, look at this, look at like, that's crazy what, what the human potential has grown, um, elevated to in this sport. And I just feel like there wasn't quite enough of that this year, in my opinion. Um, you know, it's like, I watch a baseball game, right? And I, it's, I want to see someone hit a 90 mile per hour slider. Cause I know I could never in my life ever do that. Right. And if I were to see them just kind of hit off a tee, or they just hit all soft toss after a while. Big guy, I, it's kind of boring to me. But that's my initial impression of it. Was there an event that did that the best? Where you were like, okay, when that was done, like, okay, it was a great test. We we're able to get uh, an idea of who the most fit was here. And as a spectator, holy shit, I could never do that. There's a level of comparison that I think is important. I would have to look back at the workouts. And I can bring them up right now. Um, I think Alina was cool because you could see how fast it did it and how quickly they moved with it. But I want to do that fun. one. That one was fun to watch as a, like we watched it um, actually on the screen because we wanted to be able to see the whole run too. And I think Dave, you were the same. That one was just pretty fun to watch. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I want to do that one too. You know, those are those are events that I like a lot where it's like, I want to try this one. I want to try mm -hmm. it so that I can, I mean, maybe I'll do the 35 pound dumbbell instead of the 50 uh, just to be able to like not take four hours. But, you know, when you have this level of comparison, it's like, I want to do that one. I just want to see what it's like for me to be able to put my score up versus and just see how crazy it is that these athletes are able to put up the insane times. Yeah, uh, but there there was some workouts too. Where I was like, oh, that workout's stupid. But then you watch it, I was like, oh, that was amazing, right? Like for the individuals, the skier sandbag squat. I was yeah, like, that one, that was the first, same. <laughs> at first I was like, that's not enough reps. Like, what is that? But then to see Colt and Martins, like just destroy everybody was awesome to watch. Like that brought excitement to it. And for the team, I thought the first workout on Sunday with the um, run and, and the log jump over and the rope at first, I was like, ah, like the final day and that's what we're doing. But then watching it because all the teams are out there created a lot more excitement, especially like on the final on the final sled pull, create a lot of excitement. So there was some where I was like, ah, oh, like, I don't know about that. And then it turned out to be really cool. And that there are others where I was like, eh, I don't know. Yeah. The thing that was kind of interesting that uh, going to your early point about, you know, the programming in general, it's a little disappointing when only one or two teams or individuals finishes the actual test within the allotted time. Like that to me tells me that, you know, maybe things weren't tested enough or, you know, maybe the, the setting didn't allow for it, but you would think that being that's the most fit teams in the world, most fit individuals that everyone or a majority of them should be able to finish the test. And it's just a little strange. I don't know how you feel as a coach to a team. I was like, you know, one and two teams finishing certain workouts. Like that's crazy. Like yeah. what went that, wrong in the programming for that? That was, that was my point with too many bottlenecks, you know, and on the first workout itself, nobody finished. No one was even like that close to finishing. And it's like, you know, if you failed, if you failed a legless rope climb, like you just couldn't go. And I'm like, well, why? Like the point is to just complete work and have work capacity, not who has the best legless rope climbs. Then it should be, well, if you don't get up rest, but you know, 
figure something out, but when no one finishes and then that took away from that, um, you know, the strict bar, the strict ring muscle up in the support, I thought pulled away from the intent of the workout. I enjoyed the idea of a strict ring muscle up, but I think the intent of, I, I felt like the intent of that was being able to hold and being able to do handstand holds, being able to do a ring support hold while completing work. So why I have to do a strict ring muscle up to get there? And I think for some teams that just pulled away from their abilities just a little bit. Um, like the final workout of the 196 foot unbroken handstand walk uh, twice. Like, obviously that sucks for us. And I'm not to say that because we got, we got, we couldn't even do that. Right. But what's the point of that is, you know, I think if it was just like, Hey, just complete the reps and get to that heavier worm that no one's ever used. The best handstand walking teams is still going to finish that in the one, two, three, four, and five. Right. They're not going to have a problem. I think what it does is if you don't do that, then it allows every other team to at least get a chance to get to the worm. And if they're not good at handstand walks, they're not going to be in a contention to win anyways. They're going to be so far at, by, at the end, by the time they get to the worm. I think it's just like as a way to finish and like have the last workout and then have, have a couple teams just like stand there staring at one athlete in the Coliseum with everyone looking at them. Like, I don't, there's no point to that. Like they wouldn't have finished the workout anyways. They wouldn't have been a top five in the workout. Just let them get a chance to do the walks to their ability and, see what they can do yeah i see what you're saying there it definitely creates a situation where the athlete you know especially on that floor becomes kind of an awkward situation but you know from their perspective right you're testing out things that you know athletes should be able to do, go home and work on these areas of weakness you know we should, we're testing out things you should be able to do testing out new things the seated muscle up was interesting to me you know um feet staying off the ground um you don't see that that often, right? When was the last time we saw strict muscle ups? Last time we saw strict muscle ups, they were done very poorly for the most part, right? From full hang. And there was this like in between where people were kind of kipping and some people were doing strict, some people were kipping and getting good reps for it. This was maybe like seven, eight years ago, last time we actually saw like, uh, so the seated variation, we didn't see it in the individual side, but we saw the, the teams have to manage it. And I agree that the, the support hold was kind of the the key component to it, but I actually like the idea of the standard of the seated uh, as a way to kind of uh, create a situation where people are showing that they're doing it correctly. Um, but again, the bottleneck situation from your perspective, I, I can see where you're coming from there. It definitely yeah. makes it less entertaining in some cases. Yeah, but the thing with that, Dave, with the muscle, they breathed it, it didn't have to be strict. You could kip the hell out of it. You oh, just, really? So my so then I was like, well, what's the point then? Like all you mm. you had to sit on the ground, pick your heels up, and then it didn't matter after you did that. It didn't matter. Like your feet just couldn't go with the rings, but you could kip it. And a lot of people were trying to kip it and throw their hips up. And I'm like, what? Well, what's the point? Just mm. make it a strict muscle up, or just have them get into a, a support hold. Like the support hold is gonna be hard enough in this workout for with the intensity and coming after the handstand holds and going into handstand holds. You know. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, my impression was that the seated was a way to make it strict. But if that wasn't the case, that that no, that that was the point that you got to start <laughs> here. I'm like, well, why am I? I'm like, why even start there if it's you're not making it strict? It's like just, it's like I don't know. It yeah. seemed like something extra, but just pulled away from it. Yeah, I hear you. So let, let's talk about some of the other mm -hmm. technical stuff. Um, you know, you had individual athletes in the the mass division and obviously the team, but there was some some new skills. I just want to go through some of the new skills and get your take and Mike yours as well. There were a lot of sandbags, right? Mm -hmm. Shit ton of seven, not that much barbell work. J uh, Jordan smiling over there. Cause sandbag is, uh, you know, he basically sleeps on sandbags. So sandbag workouts were all over and they were really, they were cool. Like I thought the, they, they were entertaining to watch and, you know, watching Laura just, demolish sandbag oh workouts God. was like from another planet. Like it was really exciting. So from a spectator perspective, I liked it. But first on the barbell side, Mike, did you feel like barbells were underutilized uh, across the board? Um, I don't know. I, I like how they use them. So I loved the, for a spectator point of view, the um, weightlifting total was really, really cool to watch. Like however they came up with that idea, just, continuous action basically for like 10 minutes at a time there was always a lift happening 
And then on the technical side, it was a really good display. And I had a similar thought with the handstands. It was a really good display of the athletes at the game's ability to just be dialed in like all of them. There, there were like, there were so many made lifts and you didn't have the opportunity to make a mistake. So like, I think out of all the men, I saw like maybe two not so pretty lifts and like one or two of the women that was like not so pretty, like still solid and quality. Um, so that was just impressive just to show that ability uh, and level of skill. Like there, there's no room for error. So that, that was like really, really impressive to see. And then um, just from a side note on the, the team end of things, I was impressed with how many of the athletes were kicking up into a handstand, even though they were not beautiful handstands and they were having to walk around and shuffle a lot. Like I didn't see anybody that even took more than a kick up. Like they all kicked right up and were in a handstand hold. And that was what I was anticipating was a lot of people were going to kick up and be up for like five seconds and kind of fall over or something just because it was a weird, um, you know, different thing that you don't usually have to do. And everybody, like every team on, on every, um, heat seemed like people were at least getting up for 15 to 20 seconds every time they kicked up, which was, I think showed, um, people have been practicing that stuff. So from my end, um, yeah, there can always be more barbell cause I like it. But then again, the games in general, from a spectator point of view were fun to watch. So that never bothers me. What about you, Jay? Because obviously your team are beasts. Like you put a barbell in front of your team and it's been like this for a while and it's where they excel the most. Uh, did you feel it put your team at a disadvantage or were you happy how it played out? No, I was happy how it played out for, for the team and the individuals. For the team, we did like we came in and due to like some injuries, my goal for them was to be top 20. And at the end of day one, we were pretty much fighting for a top 10 spot the entire weekend. And we only didn't, we didn't get into it due to nothing except for one of our athletes, just it was outside of her ability level to break in the top 10. Right. Um, so I think for, for us as a team, like for them to be fighting for that top 10 spot all weekend, they did absolutely amazing. And so I didn't think, I didn't think it was that bad for the, for the team, for the individuals. I, I thought there was a pretty good balance between barbell, dumbbells, kettlebells, and sandbags. Mm -hmm. I think where they fell a little bit short, though, was if you look at it, the last three workouts all favor like one predominant type of athlete. It's kind of like a bigger horsepower type of athlete, right? The muscle up sandbag, all bigger athletes excelled in that that workout. You know, Emma Lawson has the best muscle ups in the game, and she finished pretty far back for the, the top spot. You know, then from there, she has to go into the heavy hand over hand drag, um, heavy double in the workout, and then after that, she goes into the echo bike thruster, right? And so I think like if Roman didn't sprain yeah. his ankle or break his ankle, I think he would have he would have won. And some insider scoop about that is in the briefing, Roman asked, "What about?" The, or Pat Vellner asked, "What about the sandbags? Like they're going to be in our way when we jump over the logs? Is someone going to move them?" And the response was, "That's your responsibility. You have to worry about. You guys have to worry about that." And then Roman like breaks his ankle and misses out on first place, which sucks. But a side Pops note, of course, I, all over again. <laughs> yeah, right, dude. That just people. Yeah, oh them. my god. Yeah. So, I thought it was a pretty good balance. I just think the end for individuals is a little rough, um, based off certain athletes. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember uh, they had uh, Rich on the the um, commentary. They were talking to him after Roman had gotten hurt, and they were like, you know. I think Rich did a great job of just talking about how impressive it was, what Roman did and how, you know, that's sports though, right? Like obviously he's a mayhem athlete and Rich wanted to see him do well. And, you know, he was on pace. He was up by over a hundred points. I have the first day. It was insane. Mm -hmm. Like he was running away with it to Jeff's credit. He chipped away at all of that lead before Roman got hurt. So it actually right. was an entertaining last couple of days before Roman got hurt. Um, but Rich was just like, man, if Roman was ready to go for those last few events, they were like built for him. Like he yeah. would have been just like crushing that, that, uh, echo bike. That, and those that would have been so exciting to watch Adler and Roman go head to head. Cause you know, yeah. it would have been like a five or 10 point game at that point, you know? And like, yeah, Adler is a machine. I mean, that guy, like he was actually my pick to win it. It was just would have been fun to have him 
and Roman be so tight and go head to head. Yeah, really bad. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it's kind of cool to see someone not run away with it and just be like, yeah. oh, everybody's playing for second place. Like, right. yeah, but it's it makes the sport just more entertaining that there's a bunch of people in the mix. Yeah, and I thought that was great this year because last five years, male and female side has been all right. Who's fighting for second and third, right? Uh, Madero's have ran away with it a couple times, but last year was a little closer, but. This year, male, female side was just so close. But once they released the final days, everyone was like, oh, Laura's got it. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I saw this last work. And I was like, all right. Yeah. And yeah. And to Laura's credit, like she every time she was interviewed, it would just like this girl's not losing. This girl is not losing. She had a mentality of I'm here to fucking see this thing through that I've not been able to do, whether or not T is here, whether or not Mal is here. I'm focusing on myself and just fucking crushing every one of these workouts. It was impressive. Like from a, a competitor side, I was very impressed by her mentality all weekend. I was just like, she deserved it. She earned that win this weekend. hundred percent. Yeah. From teams. I, Invictus was so impressive to me. Yeah, all they like, won the first workout they, and dude, they just couldn't, it. they just could not be touched. Not even, it was just, that team was just, it was great. It was great to watch them. And they, they seem like they could go on a little run too. I mean, they there's no reason why they uh they shouldn't be at the top for a while now. Yeah, because that was your team last year. Maybe one yep. one female change, and they were what second last year or something. Yeah, that's a when we had CJ on. It's impressive. They have what three teams that qualify to the games. Uh, they have a great environment on there. We had uh, Jesse on a little while ago. Was on one of the other teams, and they just seem to uh, have figured out how to get various athletes and various teams to work together to to collaborate mm -hmm. to kind of pull the best out of one another if you had the ability to do it jay at conquer or milford i guess would you be able to navigate a few teams together all working together uh throughout a season or you think it's just too many uh, you know too many people too many mentalities too many different personalities uh to be able to get it all to work cohesively you would need a coaching staff dedicated to it. So I think at this stage for Conquer, we would be able to do it. And when I talked to CJ, he was like, I pretty much do nothing now. Everyone runs it. I just kind of oversee it. And I think that's the key. Like every one of the teams has like their own set coach um, to Invictus. And you can see it back there where each team has like one person with them. And that would be the key thing. You have to have one person that would sort of like be the head coach and oversee it. Almost feel like a football team. And then each team has like the, their one main point of contact who's me talk to him and working with them. And there's definitely going to be a lot of varying personalities that we have to deal with. Um, we did two teams one time back in when it was in Albany and we had one team qualify and one team finish in the fourth spot and top three qualified. And that was tough. A lot of personalities, a lot of inner like competitiveness that wasn't healthy, but if you mm -hmm. can do it in a way where it's a healthy environment, like they seem to be doing at Invictus, then it's just going to be great. Yeah. Yeah, kudos to them. It's not an easy thing to to manage all that. Uh, I want to go back to some of the individual stuff. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit more. You know, we'll talk some of the barbell and heavier stuff, but some of the more gymnastics technique stuff that's, that was new. Um, the inverted medley, you know, it was, I think, the last piece of the Venn diagram. You had your 5K, you had your total, mm -hmm. and that was kind of the gymnastics piece of it. Um both of your thoughts before I give my thoughts on it. What did you guys think of the introduction of the pullovers and then also the way that the um, handstand pushups were, you know, the, the freestanding handstand pushups were implemented there? What do you guys think? I think it's a good step to getting into more dynamic gymnastic stuff, um, doing some varying things, adding some different combinations together. The idea of the pullover, I think is cool. Um, I love to hear your take on how people did it and what are your thought, what your thoughts on that are. The freestanding handstand push-ups, the obstacle course, and the pirouettes. I actually thought that that was a, a good job of implementing different gymnastics movements than what we've seen for the past 15 years, but also a like a step up from the handstand pirouettes from semis. So I enjoyed it. I did. Mm -hmm. Mike, any thoughts from you, being that you are a handstand expert these days? <laughs> yeah um well first off i i mean yeah i think the pullovers are cool i think some people um hate on them because they can't do them like that's where you hear a lot of people oh, it was a stupid exercise um and oftentimes it's a person that can't really do it and you're like well i mean you don't complain about doing a butterfly chest to bar 
Um, this actually maybe has even a little more skill to it, but there's still a huge level of strength that goes into it and coordination. Like it tests a lot of things that CrossFit is supposed to be testing within a skill. Um, and I know you'll go into more of the technique side of it, Dave, but that I, I liked it. I thought it was cool. Um, I thought it was placed well into it. And then I guess on the, um, the one thing that I thought was a little bit sketchy was doing pirouettes on an elevated surface. I thought that was like, I, I think the concept of, I think you can, you can show handstand walk agility in so many different ways and interesting ways, whether it's different types of obstacle courses, there still hasn't been something like, you know, I mean, they've done in the past where you do sprint workouts and you're weaving between bags and it's very much like a football combine thing. Like why hasn't there been more um, handstand walking where you have to demonstrate more ability to laterally walk or change direction. And th I, I think that would be probably more interesting to watch, um, probably test a little bit better and then be way safer. I mean, thankfully, <clears throat> thankfully, I don't think anybody got hurt in the competition um, doing that. I know there was a really sketchy injury, somebody kind of practicing that type of skill and training prior to. Um, mm -hmm. that, that'd be my one thing is that's like, you know, some people will throw out all, you know, CrossFit's just trying to do all these party tricks and blah, blah, blah. And I, I think most of the time, CrossFit is not trying to do that. They're, they're really trying to test people's um, abilities, but when you can make something safer, especially, you know, everybody's going to go home now and be trying that. And I hope not, I, I hope not <laughs> but I think that just from walking into gyms and seeing what people try, like um, whether it's been barbell complexes in the past where there's like no reason for anybody to do certain barbell complexes. Uh, it's the same with, you know, certain levels of skill inverted. Some people just aren't ready for it. So that's my, my hot take. I, I, I think you're right on there, Mike. I think the, the elevated pirouette is probably something that most people have never tried before. And it was a high elevation. It was what, 24, 30 inch box. It was mm -hmm. not, it was not low. I mean, they have a little bit of space to be able to move their hands. It was a bigger box, but the potential for someone to just slip or, you know, body weight shift in a particular area and just nosedive. And I know that you mentioned somebody, I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was pretty ugly injury. Um, pretty severe. Uh, someone landed directly on their face and just busted up their face really badly. Um, I think it was in just warm ups or prep leading up into the. It was a. Was it a team athlete? It was a team. Yeah, he's messing around yeah. the gym and had reconstructive surgery. That day. But was it? Was he doing that? The pir pirouettes. I just want to make it, sure. No, that, it was no. a different. He. It wasn't that exact movement. He oh, was okay. Doing, okay. doing some like stepping up and trying to step onto a higher elevation, and his hand slipped. And gotcha. then his hand slipped. It was. It, but it was like a wood surface. So yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. I mean. Those things can happen. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I agree with you, Mike, that I think there are other ways to be able to uh, test handstand agility and ability to move in different directions uh, while still kind of seeing people's expertise. Uh, I had two two notes on that workout that I think are uh, worth putting out there. The first is, you know, we saw freestanding handstand push-ups again. We saw them a couple of years ago and always kipping, right? We're always seeing a kipping freestanding variation. I would love to be able to see a strict freestanding variation at some point. I think the athletes are probably at a point where they should be tested on that. Um, it's a pretty big jump from a kipping to a freestanding in terms of actually being able to show stability. Um, you can get away with a lot when you come into a crow position, when you bring the knees down to the elbows to be able to like find a stability point. You don't have that ability when you have to stay hips extended. But what ends up happening when you do one rep kind of in the line that they showed is that it doesn't show me too much proficiency in terms of being able to stabilize the movement, meaning someone can dump down really quickly, uh, not even be in a really solid tripod position. In fact, you saw a lot of athletes come down relatively head in line with hands and then have to move their hands back, like put all the weight on their head and then move the hands back to be able to find a tripod for that rep, which is, you know, it's pretty clear that the person doesn't do enough tripod handstand pushups. They, they don't understand what freestanding should feel like. So that to me was kind of telling in terms of how people train these movements. But on the way up, there was no real stability that needed to be shown with, with just one rep. You could just launch yourself from the kipping position, throw your body weight as far forward into the next rep and just walk in, walk out of it. Right. So there wasn't really any control or balance that needed to be shown in my mind. It, it was very minimal. 
Uh, you can just dump the weight forward and my shoulders strong enough to prevent me from collapsing into the walk. Great. What I would prefer to see is shorten the number of reps. So don't do half the number of reps, but do two per. Because what two will do, it will tell me that you can control back down between the repetitions rather than just throwing all of your weight forward into the next one. So same number of total reps, but do it in a way that forces the athlete to show a little bit more control. So for me, I think that would have been a nice little switch up, a variation on that workout that could have tested it a little bit more at, at a higher level in my mind. The pullovers were super interesting. Uh, we've been doing pullovers for you know years in workouts that we program, years and years. I remember uh, a workout that I did at NorCal with Kalipa and Miranda and Pat Barber and a bunch of that crew a decade ago where we were doing burpee pullovers, but per burpee pullovers over a double bar. So you had to pull over oh, wow. the double bar. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it was intense. It was <laughs> I feel like that's birth control right there. Yeah, that was no joke. Yeah, you yeah. know, it was pullovers themselves are birth control. But this was <laughs> this was no joke. We've been doing it for years and years. I remember them crushing that workout. But what was really interesting, if you watch, if you go back and watch, especially the one, the athletes that really stood out in that workout, um, Justin did really well in that workout. And on the female side, you had Danielle Brandon, who did really well in that workout. The way that, obviously, they're both good on their hands. And, you know, you put a Hanson obstacle course in Danielle's way, and she's going to crush it every time. But it was noticeable the way that they did their pullovers. And they did it more the way a gymnast might, using more momentum. So after they did the first rep, they started to use momentum into the next repetition. Mm -hmm. So from the support, they would push away from the bar, push their hips and push their shoulders. We call this in gymnastics a cast or a bail. Now, I wouldn't recommend many people doing this unless they feel comfortable coming down through the bottom with a little more momentum. But what it allows you to do is use momentum into the next repetition. So instead of coming straight down, then having to do a strict pull up and bring the hips up to the bar, which is what someone like Noah did, which is surprising because Noah has really good gymnastics mm -hmm. background. Noah was failing reps because he was coming straight down and then trying to do a strict pull on every one. If you watch uh, Justin, if you watch Danielle, they were pushing away and doing what's called basically like a three-quarter giant. So in the gymnastics world, the giant is going from handstand all the way around the rings or the bar, coming back up to handstand. A three-quarter giant is pushing away, using some momentum, and then landing on top of the bar basically on your hips. So it's a way that we teach the full giant. Three-quarter giants, we call them baby giants. That's what we started to see. We started to see kind of the first version of a baby giant, a three-quarter giant. And those guys were doing it in a way that allowed them to do 16 reps unbroken. So for me, it was, I don't know if they trained them that way or if it was something that was naturally something that they just kind of put together, but it was noticeable that they figured out something that the other athletes hadn't. So I would recommend viewers out there going back and watching that workout and watching the way that those particular athletes did it versus someone that came straight down and had to do a strict rep between them. Does that make sense? Totally. You know, I, I, I'm glad you said that because I was going to ask you your thoughts on that. And we have a girl on our team who it's crazy to see differences in athletes' capacity, but also their mental acuity around specific movements. We have this one girl on our team, Nikki, who moves exceptionally well in literally everything. And she has zero gymnastics background, zero sport background at all. And the other day we're in the gym and I was doing uh, pullovers with the team before we left for the games. And all of a sudden she jumps up and she tries something. And then she just starts doing that. I didn't know they're called three quarter giants, but that's what she starts doing. And I'm like, all right, let's come down for that before you break your hip. <laughs> but then, but to see her like do it and work on it out of nowhere, I was like, wow, it's crazy how, some athletes, she has zero background in everything. And as you're talking, like her acuity with that movement to do that was, it's fascinating to me because she just started doing it. She thought about it, picked it up and just did it. Yeah, some athletes naturally be able to do it. And then again, I was surprised at an athlete like Noah, who's normally so proficient with gymnastics movements that, I mean, it gives people this, an idea of like, okay, it's not just naturally something that people gravitate towards. Um, so I would recommend people just watching that because it's a, it's a good thing to be able to see the difference and what allows an athlete to be able to do it unbroken and create some efficiency so you can go back to the handstand walk and feel fresh. 
But um, that to me was an interesting addition and uh, to see how it was applied was pretty unique. Um, Parallel bar traverse uh, Mm. with the half pirouette. Um, Did you guys get to test that out at all? I I don't think. um, Individuals did. Yeah, the individual. They got to test it out before they went out there. I believe so. I wasn't in the warm up area after it got released, but when they were talking about it, they were setting up a parallel bar in the warm up area under the Coliseum. However, I want to say that they uh, they didn't get a lot of time to test it out because I saw Emma Lawson trip up her first time on it, which I wasn't expecting that to happen. Um, she got a little caught on it, but um, I don't think they did a lot of testing. But I know they had one P bar set up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's not like a super complex movement. Obviously, it's new to be able to shift the weight uh, from being on both rails to on one rail and then back. I like the idea of having to change direction and um, give some complexity to what it's like to be on a single rail. Uh, you know, you you feel it when you're at the top of a bar muscle up. Um, so athletes probably have some comfort level there, but uh, to be able to shift and find uh, some comfort back and forth was kind of cool to see. Um those parallel bars, again, we talked about it after the 2022 games that those parallel bars are kids' parallel bars. And I think it's important for listeners to know that those bars are not meant for adults. Um, I think it's a cost issue. I think it's a convenience issue that, you know, real parallel bars are not being used um, for this setup. They they work OK, but there's only so much width adjustment that can be done with those. So the fact that like Nikki and Vellner uh, or Roman are using the same parallel bars width wise is kind of crazy. Like, Mm -hmm. like some guys are really not able to get their shoulders or their hips through. And it puts certain athletes at a disadvantage just because it's like just not convenient to be able to move when your shoulders are that broad. Or if you're an athlete that's a little smaller and you have to go super wide with your hands. So I would love to see an adjustable set of parallel bars out there at some point, just to be able to give a little bit more of a a uniformity to the athlete experience. Yeah, I think with that workout, the hand over hand sled drag, I have mixed feelings on that. You know, I think with any workout that you put out in CrossFit, you can always say, well, it's there's always advantages and disadvantages to an athlete or a person's anatomical structure, right? But with the hand over hand sled drag essentially having them sit down with their feet on the blocks made by rogue it really came down to if you are a taller bigger athlete you're going to move it better than a smaller athlete it, it, it to me like that really didn't come down to someone's ability to complete a hand over hand sled drag it came down to if you have longer legs to push against the blocks and lay back you're going to move it faster than somebody else right because that's no one's really doing a hand over hand sled drag they're grabbing a rope and then extending their legs and falling back and then repeating that so it's like like something like that, would it have been a better test if they just had to stand up and do a hand over hand side drag, right? Because then it comes down to your ability to do a hand over hand side drag, not if you're a taller, bigger athlete, you're just going to naturally move the sled better than a smaller athlete. Yeah. You think that's why Fikowski was uh, as uh, proficient at the movement as he, he was? Yeah. I, I mean, he's great and he's fit, but there was no hand over hand dragging going on. It was just extending your legs and falling back. I think uh, Colton would agree with you uh, right. uh, with with the uh, the the log jump too. We watched that one right on the floor. That that was like taller than him. That last log dude, was like taller than feet. he was. Five and it a half was, feet. The dude is a beast. I mean, you have, yeah, you have to give the, it up. To I that wanted kid. them to offer like a springboard to him or something so it could turn <laughs> into like a mini vault to get over. That was <laughs> yeah, two hundred pound like, sandbag throwing mm-hmm. the sandbag over before. I mean, is and then the you dude, have to get over. It just favors a bigger athlete there. But yeah, that, yeah, Cole is an animal. Yeah, you got to give that guy props for um that was one to me that was is. yeah, that was one of the most impressive like guys to see make it into the finals cuz that mm-hmm. he is like the the not body type that you want to be at this point to be really successful in CrossFit. Like he's at such a disadvantage on almost every, everything at this point and he yeah, he was he was really impressive. That was probably one one of my favorite athletes to watch. Well, that, that was that was my next question. Uh, any performance, uh, impressive performances, or individuals that kind of shocked you uh, with you know maybe their whole weekend, but an individual performance that really stood out. Obviously, I think everyone's going to go to Roman for this one, right? So Roman's performance at the end was just—I I did get a little teary-eyed 
in that, especially when he's talking about his son. Um, that was just absolutely amazing to see. From the female side of things, Emma Lawson is just so impressive to me. I feel like she's so young. She's like 18 years old, right? She's still in school. Like she was at the prom last week. She moves so well. And I feel like there's not a lot of just hype and talk about her, which I, I enjoy. But everything she does is just like, she's quiet. She just works. She still studies hard for school. And she just moves really well with everything that she does. And she is just someone to me who's just ex so impressive um, in this sport right now. And Ariel Lowen, Ariel Lowen, like someone that's also crazy impressive. A mom, like I heard mm. someone saying like her training regimen is just like a mom's training program she does with her friends during the week. And on the weekend, she yeah. mashes things together. I'm like, I'm like, that's just insane. And for her to finish third is crazy. Um, Horvath dominated. It was great to see her back there, but to me, Emma Lawson, uh, Ariel Lowen, those are just two that are just so, so impressive to me with just what they're doing, how they move, their size, their weight. Like, Lawson's not that big, and she lifts awesome, awesome mm. numbers. You know, and it was fun to watch Katrin come back. I think the whole world counted her out after last year, and to have yeah. her finish top 10 was great. Um, I also had a lot of not a lot, but I did have a couple of people that was really surprised in how they finished, like not finishing well. But those are the three to me that were like super positively impressive. I would want to uh, add in in on that, Jay, too, just because they're people that we all got to experience recently at camp was um, Emma Carey kind of coming back after really oh God, yeah. she had such a rough basically weekend and then just kind of clawed her way back into like a really, really respectable finish and again a crazy young like super sweet human so mm -hmm. always nice to root for them and then alex kazan was like no like no joke just in everything yeah and then, i just i just didn't mention her because i was expecting her like yeah she's a i think beast. she's a complete that, beast to me and she's was, the nicest person to me mm -hmm. she was kind of the one like I, I think yeah like like you said quietly everybody expects emma lawson to be great now but nobody really gives her that hype and yeah. then I think the same thing, like everybody has a little bit hyped up Alex Kazan because she's just looked like such a stud now for the last year or so. And then she's mm -hmm. training, you know, out with the underdogs and has some good training partners and things, but she, like, she didn't disappoint. She like, she crushed it in some workouts and even some of the workouts where she maybe didn't do to her best. She still did pretty, pretty freaking good on everything. So the, yeah. the, again, the amount of like, younger athletes or what, what about the um the teenage athlete the 17 year old um I, yeah I'm olivia chris that 17 right. that's, that's crazy <laughs> unreal yeah. that's insane. just absolute beast uh yeah. and talk about young athletes too what jack farlow did oh with my God. the total 701 yeah. 21 years old like what is well, going on with these athletes? 390, 396 in nanos with a misstep on the catch. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah that was like, that was really that was impressive uh, in in all all things. But uh, and again, we already talked about it a little bit. But I was still blown away with what some of those guys and girls were able to do on a first attempt. And then we didn't even really talk about it. But I, I don't know if anybody's ever done like, let's say, close to a max snatch. And then essentially rested for about 10 minutes and then got into a 90% clean and jerk cold. Like <laughs> that's, that's un, unreal. Like I was so happy to see everybody do really well. And a few of the older athletes looked a little apprehensive, like going into their first clean, like, Oh, I don't know what my elbows or wrists are going to feel like right now, yeah. but yeah, his ability, I mean, being, being a little younger, I think did help for some of the athletes just to have a little more, more limber bodies. Um, the, um... But it was the sick. numbers for the team on the total, and granted, they didn't do the workouts before the individuals, but collectively, the it's numbers huge, that people right? the, the numbers that people on the teams are hitting were collectively better than the individuals. Like it was, like a guy on our team would have finished fourth mm -hmm. in, out of individuals. Like, like it was just like we were in our heat alone. There was three snatches at two ninety or more, and there was um, four or five cleaning jerks all over three fifty five. We were the second heat. Granted, we did really well in that, but the number and the girls, we had our two girls snatched 190, 185, and then clean wow. jerk 230 and 235. Yeah. And they weren't even and and they had we had a team of girls that two teams that outlifted our girls. Like two girls on snatched two. I think Wally had two girls that that clean and jerk 245 or 250. I was like, what? It was crazy. 
Yeah, um, every every year it just gets a little bit more absurd, and the athletes are just insane. Yeah, uh, on the guy side, um, I I thought Adler was going to win, but obviously him and Roman's dominant performance in the beginning before yeah. injured completely just surprised me. It, you know, it's almost like what does what does Velner have to do to win? It's kind of like the question, <laughs> right? It's like he's a, uh, that was the question. He does so good, he gets so close every year. Uh, BKG. He got hurt. I really would have liked to have seen him. Dude, a this. last place in the total to save himself and still had a really high finish. That was I, yeah, that was I would really... have really liked to have seen him not hurt and finish yeah. finish this out. I think Chandler's comeback from last year and the year before is great to see him in that podium potential spot. That was great for me uh to watch him do that. Um I was I was shocked at Medeiros. I had him on the podium. Um I think it was just a tough go for him. Uh but obviously Colton being in the top 20, that was super impressive to me as well. Another 21 year old, 21 year old Dallin getting in the top five. Yeah. yeah. Dallin, he like, I think he, he's does a not, Ameri- he doesn't stop American. impressing everybody. He's a monster. He's a monster. Yeah. Got to love but that yeah. kid. It was, it was a very exciting game. So just the points, which is people competing, the flip flopping so often, like it was great. It brought so much excitement back. I, I agree with you. And I, I we talked about this on a team call the other day uh, that from a spectator, you know, we were there doing sponsor activations and teaching, but purely from a spectator standpoint, this is one of the best games that I, I've been to. I thought it was really entertaining, you know, it was entertaining to the last event in the last day. Um, each event had like really great moments. Obviously what happened with Roman was um, one of the hallmarks of what this games will be remembered for. Um, Laura overcoming the hump and finally get on top of it. I just, I thought it had a lot of really great moments from a spectator side. And I, I would be hard pressed from a, a spectator who was actually there in person to, to tell me otherwise. Cause you know, I, this was my 10th games. Um, I've seen a lot, uh, and you know, been around to a lot of amazing, uh, moments within the sport. And this game's really like checked a lot of boxes. I thought it was done really well. Yeah. Even in the back, like, between all the events, all the coaches, all the athletes were glued to the TVs in the back, just like watching what was going on. Yeah. Uh, I got two moments that are two things that I think were impressive. I'd like to get your take on. Um, first was we got to give some love to the female coaches out there um, with Caroline Lambre, Jeff Adler's fiance and coach. I don't think people give that enough uh, kind of notice that she's an amazing coach and you know we speak highly of her not only because we think she's an amazing coach but you know she's a power monkey camper and she's been around the community with us for a long time we're just we love her and we love jeff and we love uh the fact that they were able to put on such a great performance but along with caroline michelle latondra too at deca you know coaching velner and having a hand and helping out with fikowski you know they all had great weekends and they need to be recognized. I think a little bit more for how they're coaching guys and doing an amazing job and putting guys on podium and creating CrossFit games champions. So from my perspective, from a coaching side, I think we need to give a little bit more recognition to the the female coaches out there that did such a great job this year. I agree 100%. I mean, we need to see um, more of it. Yeah. I think it was awesome. And they've been doing it consistently. You know, and I think the, I think the one downfall in, in this, in the marketing of the community is the people who talk about coaches and programmers. It's almost like a pay to play. There's so many people out there doing such a good job. And Michelle has been doing an amazing job for so long. And, and Caroline, how do you pronounce her last name? I don't want to put Lembre. Lembre. She's doing an unbelievable job with Adler. I mean, he won the game. So there's got to be a lot more recognition and marketing of that for sure. Absolutely. And the other thing that was interesting to me, I always like to bring this up when we're speaking with high level athletes, some who train with, you know, superstar teams, mega teams, and some that train on their own, you know, for all the hype and all the great things that, you know, the, the comp trains do and the HWPOs and the Invictus and the mayhem and the Proven's and all of and the brutes and where everyone kind of seems to be gravitating towards it's kind of cool to see athletes finishing in the top of the podium in the top, three that are by themselves that are not going to these may in fact in a lot of the major groups there were some underperforming happening and you know what's that a ton 
a ton. And you have Jeff winning, you have Vellner winning, both individual athletes, Fikowski training on his own. Roman was the only one training at Mayhem that is part of one of those teams. On the female side, you have Emma Lawson, you have uh, Laura finishing top two. I mean, there's something to be said for athletes figuring out how to train on their own and it not being a necessity to have to move to one of these major camps. I mean, I'm curious from your perspective, obviously you have, you have conquer and you have uh, a stake in this. What is your perspective in terms of the necessity for athletes to move to one of these camps to be able to be successful? The environment can only get you so far, but if the people leading the environment don't know what they're doing, then at some point you're going to, that's going to catch up to you. So I think a lot of these camps are great. I think the environments are great, but when things get too big and too watered down or too filtered out, it, there's a lot of, there's people that just don't know what they're doing. They haven't put the time in the trenches. And I think being able to keep things more concise and with a more tight knit group and with a team and community that's had a lot of experience and knows what they're doing is going to lead you to a healthier, more successful, longer career than mm -hmm. just a spark and a fade out. Yeah, Jay, I wonder that that sounds a little bit what I was thinking about when I was riding home and D Dave and I had mentioned or we're talking a little bit about, yeah, the people that are at big training camps and teams and all of that. And then I was reflecting back on some of my experiences from weightlifting. And a lot of times the guys who made the Olympic teams were the ones who trained on their own with like a coach that was, you know, maybe respected and well-known, but not one that had a ton of athletes. And a lot of the guys that went to the big training plans and training programs and stuff like that um, didn't always have the best results. And I'm wondering, so, to, you know, take, for example, like a Jeff and a Caroline, um, she's able to put all her attention into him and everything is individualized. And, um, at that level, I think that can play a big role. Whereas maybe if you go, you know, to one of the big groups and you have one coach trying to do too much and not having enough, maybe support with other coaches around, like every athlete can be so different at that point. And like just load management and intensity and dealing with personality all comes into play. So if I feel like if maybe you just have, you know, one, one person trying to do too much for a big group of athletes, maybe they're, yeah, they're falling through the crack a little bit when it comes to programming or like individualization. 100%. I mean, this, this could be a whole other podcast. I feel like I can get down a lot of rabbit holes with this topic. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to, cause I know this time, but that's the thing is like, you have to have people that understand what they're doing from a principal standpoint of strength and conditioning, but also an athlete standpoint, management standpoint, communication, uh, dealing with emotions. Like there's so much into it to be successful. And if people only understand one method based off what they've been taught from the higher ups, then that's all they're going to be able to go back to. They won't be able to adjust and adapt based on who the person is. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Jay. I think we covered a pretty good amount. Um, appreciate the time. Just heading back home after a long week out in Madison. Our last time being in Madison. Uh, mm. Sad to see another city go by the wayside, but we don't know where we're going next year yet officially, but it'll be fun to uh, take on a new city and a new state come 2024. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. This was You got nice. it. I love you guys. You as well, man. Uh, any parting words? Anywhere, and where can uh, people follow along with the Conquer team? Uh, Conquerathlete.com. Instagram is Conquer Athlete or myself, Jason Lydon. And make sure everybody signs up for the next Power Monkey Fitness Camp. Yeah. And along those lines, Power Monkey Camp in the fall, our 20th, our 10 year anniversary is sold out. Whoa. Sorry to hear that. We sold out actually a couple of months ago. Um, a lot of return campers. So those return campers, Listening in, you're going to have some familiar faces around. We got a lot of exciting stuff going on. Uh, our 21st camp uh, in the spring of 2024 is up. We're about half sold out for that one already. So that one's actually going to sell out pretty quick. So if you are interested in coming out, hanging out with us sometime soon, check it out at powermonkeycamp.com. Sign up for next spring. The dates are going to be April 28th to May 4th. There are some open spots for that one. For everyone else, please be sure to head over to PowerMonkeyFitness.com for services and other upcoming events. You can check out our Instagram pages for regular teaching and technical content at PowerMonkeyFitness, at Dave Durante, and at Mike Service. On behalf of PowerMonkey Fitness, we're your hosts. I'm Dave Durante with my co-host, Mike Service. Until next time, thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm.